driven by a single motor in a nominal alternating tripod gait like that used by insects. The three spoked appendages, called wings, combine the speed and simplicity of wheels with the climbing mobility of legs. Their wings are compliant so that their gates adapt to the terrain in a cockroach-like manner. These mechanisms enable the robots to traverse terrain and climb obstacles that would be difficult or impossible for a wheeled vehicle to navigate, at speeds currently unattainable by any legged robot at this scale. A body flexion joint, also found in cockroaches, enables our WEGS robots to surmount more complex obstacles. The compact mini WEGS uses four WEGS in an alternating diagonal gate to sustain speeds of up to 10 body lengths per second over smooth and rough terrain. <laughs> it uses only one motor to drive the WEGS and one micro servo for steering. Its lightweight and robust construction allows it to sustain repeated falls from a height of over 10 body lengths and tumble down a flight of stairs with no damage. Crickets and click beetles use jumping to surmount obstacles of immense relative size. A version of Miniwigs has been developed based on this concept. It can surmount obstacles two to three body lengths in height. A review is unmanned ground vehicles being developed in. Okay, so I, I, I show this video because um, it's an interesting and creative hybridization of wheels and legs. It's very difficult to get a fast moving robot and they succeed in this research. This is done in uh, a Case Western Reserve University in, in Cleveland. Uh, the leading researcher there is uh, Roger Quinn. Um, and the other interesting thing with the smaller uh, WEGS robots is there's no up or down. So the robot can e equally move whether it's upside down or right side up. Um, and that's very, very interesting. So it's the combination of wheels and legs the speed of the robot, and that there is no up or down in, in the uh, uh, construction of the, the mechanism. Um, in a recent uh, uh, project uh, with another artist, uh, Nina Sellers, uh, both of us underwent um, uh, uh, surgical operations to remove biomaterial from each of our bodies. It was a kind of um, collaboration that was the result of physically subtracting from each body. And uh, this is the amount of material uh, collected from the two, two artists. Uh, the contents of this material um, uh, uh, was a combination of uh, 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 peripheral nerve endings, uh, subcutaneous uh, fat, uh, connective tissue, uh, xylocaine, um, O positive uh, blood. Uh, the body tissue uh, was, we, were, we had great difficulty in accessing uh, the, the contents of our operations. It was very difficult to legally obtain uh, the material. It's very interesting. Inside your body, the material is fine. But if it's externalized, all of a sudden it becomes biohazardous. <laughs> so uh, obtaining the material uh, was very, very difficult. Um, we constructed uh, uh, an installation which we call Blender. And this was a, 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 an installation that was a human, human height. Um, this contained the biomaterial uh, with a blender uh, and uh, uh, four oxygen tanks that intermittently bubbled through the, the blended material and also actuated the blender blades. Uh, so this uh, material from the two artists was constantly being uh, uh, blended. It, it's a kind of the opposite to the stomach sculpture. Whereas the stomach sculpture uh, contained uh, this uh, uh, bit of uh, robotic technology, here it's a machine that contains uh, a liquid body. But it's a, a body that is a composite body uh, from two artists. And you can see the layers of, of, uh, of um, material, uh, protein down the bottom. Uh, this is xylocaine. Uh, any fatty material floated 
uh, to the top. And then about every five minutes, the blending would occur and the material would gradually settle again. So this is the scale of, of the machine. So this project was first uh, visualised in about 1996 and it's taken almost 10 years to find surgical assistance uh, to realise the project. Um, initially the ear was, I imagined the ear to be uh, beside my real ear. But uh, when I showed this uh, 3D model uh, to my doctor friends, they advised me that this was not a very good position. <laughs> uh, firstly, uh, firstly the, um, the, the bundle of nerves that come uh, uh, out of the skull into the face emanate from about this area. So there was the problem of maybe paralyzing half of my face in doing any operation in constructing the ear in that position. Secondly, this is also uh, next to my uh, jawbone. So of course every time I chew or I speak, the ear would wiggle. <laughs> this would be an unintended side effect. Um, and so anatomically and aesthetically, unfortunately, this was not a suitable position. Um, in 2003, in Perth, uh, with the assistance of Tissue Culture and Art Project and Symbiotica, uh, we decided to grow a series of ears, 